The accelerometer is a type of sensor that, as its name suggests, is capable of detecting the acceleration of an object, or, in other words, detecting changes in its rate of displacement over a period of time. This type of sensor is used in hundreds of applications, including seismic sensors, mechanical systems analysis, and airbag activation during a crash, just to name a few. In fact, if you are watching this video from a phone, then you have an accelerometer in your hands at this very moment. Because of this versatility and the number of contexts in which the use of one of these sensors can be useful, in this video we will analyze how an accelerometer works and its different variants. We will start by analyzing how a mechanical accelerometer works in detail, as this will give us the theoretical basis to understand how most of the other variants work. They are mainly composed of three elements, a base frame, a spring or some other elastic element, and finally, a mass. If we leave this system at rest, the distance between the mass and the base frame will remain stable. However, if we lift the entire system, the mass will move at a different speed than the base frame, and the distance between these two elements will increase and then stabilize again. In this simple action, multiple elements come into play, and they will allow us to know the acceleration of the system. The first of them we will take from Newton's first law, and is the use of an inertial reference frame, that is, a reference frame in which it is fulfilled that when the forces applied on an object are equal to zero its acceleration will also be zero. In this case, our inertial reference system is the room in which we are performing the experiments, because, from our point of view, it is static. Within this system, when we lift our accelerometer we will be applying a force on the base frame, which will be transmitted to the spring and then to the mass, which causes everything to move and it is a bit confusing to understand what is happening. To simplify this problem, we will fix our inertial reference frame on the base frame, ignoring what is happening on the outside. This time, when we analyze the behavior of the accelerometer, all we will see is that the mass goes up and down, which means there is a force being applied on it. More specifically, a fictitious force known as inertia force. Now that we know that there is a force on the mass, the next step is to know the magnitude of that force, and for this we will rely on Hooke's law of elasticity, which relates the compression or elongation of a spring with the force that is being applied to it. More specifically, it tells us that the applied force is directly proportional to the variation of its length multiplied by an elastic constant, the latter being a characteristic of the spring used, and, therefore, a previously known constant. Understanding this, if we measure the length of the spring when it was at rest and calculate its difference with the length of the spring when the accelerometer moved, we will have all the necessary information to calculate the inertia force using Hooke's law. Now we are left with the last step, how to use the value of the inertia force to calculate the acceleration of the system. We will do this using Newton's second law, which tells us that the force applied on an object is equal to its mass multiplied by the acceleration generated as a result of that force. Although, as in this case we are interested in knowing the acceleration, we can rearrange the formula by saying that the acceleration of an object is equal to the force applied to it divided by its mass. This way, we get to know the acceleration without knowing its velocity of motion. We still have a small design problem though. Since the acceleration occurs over a short period of time, eventually the spring will cause the mass to return to its initial state, so it would be difficult to store this data manually for later calculations. An easy way to transfer this information is to make this same mass move some element capable of leaving a mark on a piece of paper, as well as to continuously move this paper so as not to overwrite the information generated. You probably already noticed, but what we have just built is basically a seismograph, one of the first types of accelerometers that were developed. In fact, to this day it's common to refer to the mass of the different types of accelerometers as seismic mass. This type of accelerometer, as well as several of the ones we will see later, are only capable of detecting accelerations on a single axis, because, if we decided to move it sideways, then the spring would bend to the side and we could no longer use Hooke's law to calculate the inertial force. Fortunately, we can use the same principle to measure accelerations in different axes by simply changing some elements or even just rotating the accelerometer. Mechanical accelerometers make it possible to obtain information without the use of complex circuits, since they only need a material such as paper to store it. However, this is also one of their limitations, 
since the reduction of the system would also mean the reduction of the written information and its accuracy. It is because of this, that currently most of the accelerometers used work by other methods that can be miniaturized and are able to deliver the information digitally, which are better known as MEMS or microelectromechanical systems. The first of the accelerometers in this category that we will discuss is known as a capacitive accelerometer. Capacitive accelerometers work in a similar way to mechanical accelerometers, the major difference being the way in which mass motion is converted into information. In this case, two plates of conductive material are used, a static one positioned in the system as a reference point and a dynamic one that moves along with the mass when it is affected by some acceleration. If we focus only on the metallic plates, we will realize that they form a capacitor, which, if we remember a little, are components capable of storing electrical charges which are mainly composed of three elements, a conductor, a dielectric or electrical insulator and a conductor, being the dielectric simply the air in this case, because, this way, both plates are kept electrically separated while being able to move freely at the same time. Moreover, the capacitance, that is, the unit of measurement that indicates the capacity of a capacitor to store energy, can be calculated in simple cases as the dielectric constant of the material separating the conductors multiplied by the area of the conducting plates and divided by the distance between the two plates. In this formula, since we already know that the dielectric material is the air, we can look up its dielectric constant in a reference table, and furthermore, since someone must have built the accelerometer in the first place, the area of the conducting plates will also be known. Thus, the capacitance between the two plates will vary only as a function of the distance between them. In other words, we will have a way to translate the capacitance of the accelerometer into the mass displacement distance, the distance into a force, and the force into an acceleration. It may seem a bit convoluted, but we don't actually need to do these calculations every time we want to know the acceleration. Similar to the seismograph, where really all we were interested in was the final mark, here, all we are interested in is the voltage generated which we can then check against a reference table that tells us what acceleration it corresponds to. If we start in a state of rest with a stable amount of electrical charges accumulated on the capacitor plates, and due to an acceleration these begin to gather, the capacitance will increase. When this happens, a greater amount of charge carriers will be able to move towards the plates, generating an electric current that can be measured. Conversely, when the mass starts to move away, the capacitance will decrease, the charge carriers will move away from the plates, and a current will be generated in the opposite direction. This type of accelerometer can be made in really small sizes, and therefore it can be used in all kinds of electronic devices. Although it is worth mentioning that since it uses air as the dielectric of the capacitor, if the capacitor changes its composition, so will its dielectric coefficient and the capacitance of the whole system. Therefore, in practical terms, the accuracy of these sensors can be affected by changes in ambient temperature or humidity. The next type of accelerometer we will discuss in this video is the piezoelectric accelerometer. This variation again uses a mass that moves when an acceleration is applied to the system. However, this time it will not occur completely freely, but its movement will be constrained by a piezoelectric material. This type of material has the quality of generating a small amount of electric current when it is deformed, either by being compressed or by returning to its initial state. Thus, when the mass moves it compresses the piezoelectric material, generating an electrical signal, which can then be used to estimate the acceleration that was applied to the sensor as in the capacitive accelerometer. The fourth type of accelerometer we will discuss is the piezoresistive accelerometer. These use, as the name implies, piezoresistive materials, which, when deformed, change their electrical resistance, that is to say, the ease or difficulty with which the electric current can pass through them. In one of the simplest versions of this type of accelerometer we could have a mass connected to a fixed place by means of a beam, positioning a piezoresistor on it. When an acceleration is applied to the system and the inertial force on the mass causes the beam to bend, the piezoresistor will compress or expand depending on the movement of the beam, allowing us to measure the new value of the electrical resistance and use that information to indirectly estimate the acceleration. The great thing about this technique is that we can use more than one piezoresistor to estimate the deformation generated by inertial forces. In fact, 
We can use a single mass and eight piezo resistors to make an accelerometer capable of detecting acceleration changes in three axes of motion at the same time. More specifically, we can position a mass attached by four beams to a base frame, also adding two piezo resistors to the ends of each beam. This way, each time the mass deforms the beams as a result of an acceleration, all electrical resistances change their value, and that information can be used to calculate the exact force and direction of the acceleration that was applied to the system. I'm not saying that this calculation is simple, but at least it's possible. The fifth type of accelerometer is the Hall Effect Accelerometer. To understand how it works, we must first understand what the Hall Effect is. This occurs when we have an electric current passing through a conductor which in turn is passing through a magnetic field. One would expect the electric charges to pass through the conductor following the shortest path, a straight line. However, in reality, the electric current is distorted due to what is known as the Lorentz force. Because of this, a voltage that is perpendicular to the direction of the current is generated, also known as the Hall voltage. In other words, the Hall effect allows us to know the strength of a magnetic field based on the voltage generated. If we take this same system, attach it to a mechanical accelerometer and make the magnets face in opposite directions, we have everything we need to detect acceleration. When an acceleration causes the plate to move upward, a Hall voltage will be generated, and when the plate moves downward past the center point, another Hall voltage will be generated but with the opposite sign. This is because the direction of the magnetic field reverses after that point. In this way, we can translate the magnitude and sign of the Hall voltage into the magnitude and direction of the acceleration being applied in this system. The sixth and last type of accelerometer we have left is the thermal accelerometer. This type of accelerometer has an extremely simple principle, to detect the temperature around a heat source. If we have a candle on a table in a closed room, the flame will remain relatively stable. However, when we move the candle, the flame will tilt in the opposite direction of the movement, due to the inertial force applied to the flame and the air resistance. What is more, its inclination will be proportional to the speed in which we move the candle. Considering this behavior, we could theoretically position four temperature sensors around the candle and use that information to estimate the direction of motion and the acceleration of the system. Clearly, in reality these systems do not use a candle. They are miniaturized, and work by heating an electrical resistor, but the idea is exactly the same. This accelerometer in particular is able to operate without moving parts, a quality that, as I have repeated a thousand times, drastically reduces the chances of system failure, even during falls. Of course, not everything is perfect. This type of accelerometer, unlike many of the previous ones, requires a continuous source of energy to generate a signal. I hope you liked this video, and if you think what I do is worthwhile I remind you that you can help me to make more and better videos by supporting me on Patreon.